I'm Tom Ray, and this is my art podcast. On this episode of the podcast, I get the chance to meet Lindsay Kovna, multimedia artist. Looking at some of your stuff that you have over the internet, it's changed a lot over the years, and they're different. And, and I don't know how much of it you still do and how much of it you've changed. So I want to start first with how I found you and why I wanted to contact you, which is, so I'm in a band called Lorenzo's Music, and a while back, in like 2006, there was this band Man Man that released an album, and every, and people were telling me, they're like, hey, is this you guys? Like, literally, they thought it was us. And I was like, no, this is much better. <laughs> so so I started listening to Man Man, a great album, all kinds, you know, love them over the years. Just recently, I decided, I, I wanted to animate a video for an upcoming EP that we have. And I was trying to look for examples of, because I don't want to, you know, I have something in my head, but then you try to go look at like, what have, what have other people animated for videos and get mm -hmm. something that's like, instead of just what's in your head, maybe it'll give you another idea. So I started searching around and I was like, I wonder if Man Man ever did an animated video. Seems like something they do. So I searched <laughs> YouTube and I found your YouTube channel and it had the Man Man video on there. And I'm like, with the amount of views and the amount of subscriptions you had, I'm like, is this just something that she made for the song and put it out there. But then when I looked more, you won a freaking Nicktoons award for it. So then I was like, what, what is this person? So I looked you up on Instagram. You have two accounts on Instagram. You have an art account and a personal account. You and have that art account got lost when I switched phones. So now I can't even access that account. <laughs> I was wondering why one of them hadn't been updated in a while. Okay. And then, so then I finally, I was just like, this is all fascinating. And the fact that now I was like a half hour into looking you up online and I was like, well, I need to talk to this person. So I reached out to you and that's what brings us here today. So let's start first with the man, man video. Now it is a multimedia sort of stop motion, sort of pixelated or live action. It, it's a lot of stuff. So could you first tell me how that video got started and what you did to make that? It was the first thing I did when I graduated art school. Like I went to school for animation like my senior animation in art school was like this mixed media extravaganza. It was like black and white, like hand drawn animation. And then this character goes into like a stop motion world where everything's in color. And um, so it's like, yeah. And then there's like live action, there's pixelation, it's everything combined. And then somebody was at that show and they came up to me. It was Man Man's pseudo tour manager or something like that. Okay. Like worked at UArts, the college I went to. And they came up to me and, um, you know, at our local coffee shop <laughs> and they were like, I really want you to do this music video for Man Man, but I don't want you to tell them. Like, can you do it like, you know, oh. on the, <laughs> the DL, like, don't let them know. And I was like, I don't know about that. Why? You know, like, cause well, he's exactly. like, well, I why? <laughs> I <know. laughs> he's like, I don't think Ryan from Man Man I, they don't know what's good for them, basically. Like, I want you to do this. This is what's really good for them. And I soon found out why that was the case. Because, like, this guy had a vision. And he understood, like, what would look good with man-man music. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why he approached me. So, But I was like, no, I want to meet them. I want to talk to them about it. You know, maybe we could get paid for this. Maybe it would be good. So I met with all of them. And, I mean, Ryan told me from man-man that he was more interested in getting of having a, a video that was like hipster girls playing volleyball that's what his idea of his, <laughs> of a mu his ideal music video would be okay like mentally clad ladies playing volleyball or something uh -huh. like that. And I was, okay i can kind of see why <laughs> this guy wanted to go behind his back and just make a video so anyway we ended up like making the video more collaboratively and involving them and video recorded their heads on green screens and like superimposed it draw hand-drawn animation bodies and included them in the whole process like showed them like storyboards and everything so I got their approval all the way through so they were into it and they definitely were into it there was talk about getting it on like a compilation with Tom Waits videos too and there was talk about that how but wait how so like just using his videos or like yeah, trying to yeah, I think like the guy, somebody that was in charge of Man Man or some ha had hands in Man Man <laughs> was like trying to make a compilation of all these different videos. At the time, it was like 2005. So it was like 
way before like the internet was as happening. Yeah, like YouTube um, had just started in 2005, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, that's why my video is so pixelated on there because it's like, you know, I got it up right when it started. Yeah. I was thinking about like, liquid television. I was always made it as noisy as possible <laughs> with a lot going on, as much going on as possible, and just really weird characters and aliens and uh, creatures, characters. I, I kind of did it like frame by frame, like you know, lyric by lyric, uh, just illustrating the lyrics of that song. Yeah. And like the the giant fee fi fo fum, I smell the blood of an Englishman. Like we made this giant stop motion doll. Mm -hmm. you know, it had like a wire armature inside, and we did like the whole like process of molding. Like we made a mold and we cast the mold, and we tried to involve like Philly in there because it was very you know man, it was like you know a Philly band, and we wanted to have like I remember, Pat's and Gino's cheese steaks is really popular. So How long did it take you to make this? You just now were talking about creating a giant monster then you've got a bunch of other stuff and then layering of video on top of mixed media art like how long did the whole project actually take you to do oh my god it took probably a year right out of school i got a job with this guy moses who hired me to be an animator to make this tv station for psps <laughs> you're talking about back when psp had kind of like the first portable video machine but it also played games i remember everybody was trying yeah. to make formats for that during that time that's right <laughs> yeah i know it's like i guess it was like the first prototype of like what could be but yeah I, uh, I got a job with him and he said and he really didn't have a way to like make money off of me or kind of didn't it was so strange it was like the strangest job he just wanted me to develop content and get all of my friends that i went to art school with to contribute their content to some tv station but he had this amazing studio space he's like oh you can use the studio space to work on the man man thing and then oh and then you have to put put on a, a show of man man playing live at our space and then you get all the money i'm putting on that event too and we made this gigantic event and then I ended up making money from that, kind of, make, like maybe $400 or something. But really he got Man Man to not pay me for that, uh, to not pay for the music video in exchange for them playing live in our space. So I agreed to that because I was stupid right out of school. I used the space there. It has like a long, like I think that music video, we, we first started working on it in like my friend Ken's basement, who I, we were collaborating on the video. Uh, we like used his basement, set up this big green screen, this like, you know, dingy, dark basement in, in South Philly, and then got got the job with Moses, and then moved on to like this, you know, more like larger warehouse space to work on it, which was like a nice change. But okay. so it went through different, like locations and you know scenarios. Well, how did you win a Nicktoons award? Frederator. <laughs> Do you ever? Hear oh that? yeah, they were the ones that were involved in like Fairy Odd Parents and all that kind of stuff. So they. I think maybe they contacted me or something. Maybe it was, I can't remember what happened first. There was definitely a write up on Pitchfork about the video, but they reached out to me and then I know they're connected to Nicktoons. Did you get to go or anything like that? Or it was just, it was submitted? Oh, it, was all on, it was TV. Oh, okay. It was just like broadcasted on TV. That's cool. Yeah. It's really cool. Cause I still get like teenagers who were like really young when they saw it on TV right. and they comments on like my YouTube uh, video of it. And they're like, oh my God, I can't believe I, I saw this on Nicktoons when I was like seven. <laughs> Where were you even going to college at? I went to University of the Arts in Philadelphia. What kind of animation were you looking to do? I had a dream of doing, of being like an independent animator, experimental, independent animator, having my own company. You know, it was right out of school when I got the music video, I was like, and then I got another music video after that, Plastic Little, and another music video. Uh, so I had like three or four music videos. Really? And I was like, oh, I'm going to make a you know animation studio. But Had you, you gotten know. paid by this point? Because so far, <laughs> you could get the videos just fine. Getting paid was very difficult. Yeah, I kind of got paid for Man Man, not really. I got paid for Plastic Little, kind of. Everybody would offer you like little bits of money. There was this band, Mixel Pixel. He paid me for that. I can't remember how much, but it was like decent, but not enough to live off of, you know, I mean, right. and for the amount of time that you put into these things, it's like, I remember reading like professional music videos get paid, you know, people that make them get paid like $10,000 at the least, mm -hmm. which makes a lot of sense because it's, you know, so time consuming. And I mean, especially if it's animated, I did like the final music video that I did was 
a tiny bit animated and then mostly live action because I'm like I'm not I can't put myself into another music video like this but I was also working full-time I started teaching art and I was trying to do that too and I just kind of like yeah, it was yeah. a lot. You said you started teaching. So how did you get into teaching? Like, were you teaching kids? Were you teaching college? Like, what kind of things were you teaching? I started out teaching animation for after school programs and like, you know, different things. Like I started little programs at places hmm. like there's this community center that I started like animation, like a little animation program there, like elementary age to like middle school and so I was thinking, oh, I would do that. Like, maybe I'll just go into schools and just do that kind of thing. But then, like, in 2008, I was also doing caricatures, too. So I was, like, oh, wow. kind of balancing a couple different things. Okay. Because, like, when I graduated college, it seemed like there was a lot more money going around. And then 2008 hit, like, a few years after I graduated college. And it was, like, you know, the recession. So I ended up going back to school for teaching. So Because I was doing a lot of teaching gigs. Mm-hmm. And I, I thought, you know, I might as well just get certified to teach and my mom was a teacher so she was encouraging and my parents were both encouraging it because they're like well stability and you know you're you're an artist you're not gonna succeed at this (laughs) you went and got certified how long does something like that take it took a year i did like a year long program student teaching for half of it after you got out of being certified were you able to find a job teaching and also was it in the arts i ended up moving a lot so i was in philly and then i ended up dating another artist and they went back to school for human computer interaction at the time it's called human computer interaction now it's ux design ah okay i was like what the hell is that (laughs) (laughs) yeah nobody calls it that anymore but he went to school he moved to pittsburgh and we were having a long distance relationship so i was in philly he was in pittsburgh i got my certification and then i moved to pittsburgh to be with him i kind of gave up a lot of my you know, my art practice kind of thing. I substitute taught when I got to Pittsburgh because I I was licensed to teach in in Pennsylvania. So I did substitute teaching for like three months. And then my partner at the time decided he wanted to move to California. And then he got a job in San Francisco. So then I moved to San Francisco because he was always like, Lindsay, you got to get out of Philly. You live there your whole life. Like, let's travel. We got to like see the world and get inspiration that kind of thing. So I'm like, all right. Yeah. So that's why I moved to Pittsburgh. And then he went to move to San Francisco. So I was like, all right, I should give it a try, you know, see what the other coast is like. And I got, I had to get certified in California, which was a pain. Take a bunch of classes again and get certified. But in the meantime, I got a job. My first teaching job was at a charter school in uh, Santa Clara. So I lived in San Francisco and I commute like an hour down to Santa Clara every day. And I taught digital art. And I, I, got, I didn't get paid very well, but you know, it was like, a, <laughs> <There's>, <laughs> there seems again. to be a running theme in this interview. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, it took me a long time to realize that like, I think I deserve to make some money. Yeah. Did you move to New York for work or how did you end up back there? Or not back there. How well, did you end up there? We got married and uh, we're not married anymore, but um, my ex <laughs> decided that we wanted to move back to the East coast, uh-huh. but we wanted to like try to be, artists like all right we're gonna do this you know we should try new york just to try and see if we can what was your plan i mean my plan i was gonna get a teaching job again and then like try to connect with like you know animators that i used to know or like get involved with i was gonna get in touch with them and then you know try to reach out to people and reconnect and i was thinking oh yeah like well i had an art show and like Brooklyn that I curated once and maybe I could that could happen again I was thinking it would be really easy uh-huh. you know, to reconnect with people and everybody would remember me and it would just be so easy and just natural yeah when I got to New York it was like really really tough it's a it's a time thing and you have to be like dedicated figuring it out too because it's such a huge city it was like a, a rude awakening <laughs> more of the show after this break I ended up going into u- user experience design, UX design. Oh, you did? I, did. I went to General Assembly and actually met my new husband there. Now I'm currently at Houghton Mifflin Haircourt, which is like an educational publishing company. So it's kind of like mixing my worlds together and it, it, it has the potential to be a creative job. They're working on like a video, educational video game, having animated elements to it and I'm starting to see the connection that could be possible between user experience design and animation. Maybe there's a potential for some creativity there. 
Uh, and I love I love brainstorming animation. I know that's like my passion because I get into these brainstorming sessions with people, and I'm like I start to get really excited and happy. Like this is actually where I belong is in the animation realm because mm -hmm. my my current job is very you know practical. User experience design is so practical, right. like where are buttons placed and it's logical, it's practical. It's, but animation is like this thing that's it feels like endless possibilities, mm -hmm. and I really do want to get back into that. I just don't know how to like make that happen you know I, I'm, I'm thinking about trying to connect to people maybe collaborate with animators i used to collaborate with or try to form new collaborations do something for fun yeah it doesn't have a lot of pressure and weight on it i've just been thinking about doing little like little animations that loop or something or just sort of like experimental things i feel like short animations are you say in a loop there that short animations have the opportunity to do something right now. Like you can do something that's really cool, really interesting and not have to spend an ungodly amount of time on it. And then maybe you could do more and build it up there. I mean, you look at things like TikTok or like the boomerang feature in Instagram or a lot of portfolios will just have animated gifts that somebody will do like a really smooth Adobe Illustrator thing in there but I see those all the time and at the at first I'm always like that's not true traditional animation and then I just stop myself and go shut up these people are doing animation why am I criticizing the fact that they're enjoying that let them mm -hmm. do it however you make it doesn't matter part of it, I keep reading more, more and more things and listening to things that it's like you know you're not a one I guess it's like it's still like an artist <laughs> I'm just reading that oh yeah but I read like, that too yeah yeah my friend just got my coworker just bought that for me it's so inspiring stuff like you know people aren't supposed to just do one thing like you have to like have your hand in a bunch of different things especially you know as an artist to keep the inspiration going you know to keep it interesting mm -hmm. kind of just have to like do whatever you feel like doing and just have it all available to you mm -hmm. like oh, i'll just dive into this today or this or you know just have it set up i think that's the key i've been painting a little so i like, was gonna ask you about painting because yeah. that one that's behind you you actually posted that recently how's how's that been going the painting i'm trying to get inspiration from wherever you know like let it hit me and write it down and so i just watched the joker movie Are, were you a fan or were you not because i was everybody else is complaining I, I liked it i did like it i yeah. liked it and okay. I, it's, it's a kind of it's like stuck with me it was intense and it was hard to watch the some of the cinematography it was really cool and the shots are really cool um the layering of uh shots like there's that one really cool scene where he's like on the bus and there's like behind him there's like graffiti and there's a window and then it goes out to the street and it's like these layers of like imagery which kind of reminds me of like animation just like the layers of imagery that the panes of like that disney used to use like the different layers of uh oh the multi-plane camera yeah the multi-plane camera and yeah how we got depth in mm -hmm. animation which is like the hardest thing to do especially when there wasn't really that much computer animation at the time when he was doing stuff i think that's always the thing i'm trying to figure out too is just how to get depth the reason why I get into painting too is this like thinking about colors and how you can get depth by using colors and have more control over like color and the limiting of color and like using everything in a more deliberate way, which I think is like something that the old masters and just like painting holds the key to understanding like imagery at a basic level. That's something that I never really learned when I was in art school. Why do you do it? Why do I do art? Yeah. There's a lot of reasons. Like, just like the physical act of doing something like that, like creating something, it gives me satisfaction when I finish it or just even doing it at all. Like, I've noticed, like, even just making a really crappy drawing, I still get satisfaction from that. Just putting a pen to a paper and, and realizing that's the only thing you you can do that's free, like, completely free. and nobody's telling you what to do it's like freedom i think Lori anderson said that once I was, like art is like freedom there's no rules and laws and and just the act of doing something like that it's kind of rebellious too what would you say is the most difficult thing about animation or painting or anything that you do artistically i guess sitting down and just making yourself do it <laughs> that's probably the most difficult thing for me really right now at the end of a day of like, you know, work or something or 
because I've been moving so much too. I think to actually be in a place of stability of like, you know, I can focus and have like a room. I mean, now I have a studio and a room, but I loved having a studio outside my house, but I like having a place to go outside my house to get really messy and, you know, not worry about, you know, messing up the floor or something like that or the wall. <laughs> Nobody comes through and is like, what is this right now? Yeah. <laughs> like, like when you're midway through something and it looks like crap, but there's potential there. Yeah. It's the act of being able to walk away and just have a place that you go to. It's yeah, yeah. the act of going somewhere, of unlocking a door and walking in, that that sort of thing. I, I get yeah. that. Do you, do you do a lot of uh, 2D art or is it mostly like stop motion and, and mixed media? Oh, like hand-drawn animation? Yeah. Yeah, I used to do a lot of that. It's like what I prefer the most because well, I think drawing like the, comes easiest to me. So have you ever done any animation doing that in Flash or anything? Still using Flash. Well, now it's called Animate. Uh, they changed the name of it. Yeah. But and the reason I asked that is because I've been messing with, and my God, the learning curve is huge, but it also involves 3D art. The newest oh. version of Blender, which is free to download, it's 3D software, right. but they have a plugin now that originally was just meant for annotation. It was called Grease Pencil. And you could like take notes on like something you were doing in 3D and you were able to use like a marker and draw, but the inking was really good. So people started, of course, you know, as people do, they started thinking, how can we use this to do hand-drawn animation in Blender? And then finally Blender was like, hell with it. We're going to build it directly into it as 2D animation. So you're doing multi-plane animation. You draw on it. It sets up as a 2D environment, just like you would with traditional hand-drawn animation. Mm -hmm. But then you switch to say a 3D viewpoint, you go outside of the camera and you can look and you'll see there's your drawing on a plane and you can like create things behind it and have stuff move like it's in a 3D environment, but it's 2D animation. It's really interesting. And like the concept of it, when you think of it, it's like, oh, I get what you mean. But when you try to use it, it's such intense software that it's like, I've, it, <laughs> it took me like three weeks to do like a 10 second animation. It turned out super cool, but, <laughs> but it took me forever. But once you get it, it's one of those things where I feel like once you get it, it's just going to be like, oh, and I can do this and this. So I suggest checking that out if you want to see it. And it's free software. I would suggest yeah. trying that. That's both 3D and 2D animation mixed together. And with what you do, I would love to see what you do with that, with that software the way your mind works, it would be like, you're doing 2D animation. It's like, but what if I brought in this fabric and you can bring in video? It would be perfect for you. Yeah, wow. That's, That's what awesome. I would, give it a try. Did you, you check that out? on animation too? I know you like comics. Yeah, my comics are just a way for me to draw something every day. Like I literally only spend 20 minutes. Like I will not spend more than 20 minutes and I just draw something that happens. So that way I have a subject and I make sure that I have to try and create an environment and a story within 20 minutes just to keep my chops up because I wasn't drawing ever and I'd always push it off. So this was one way for me to do it for the animation. Yeah. I was, it was one of those things kind of like your background where I was first, I just wanted to get back in animation right around 2005. I was just searching, following all these internet videos. The best part was is since YouTube wasn't around, I was able to download the flash files and you could open them up in Flash and actually study the actual animation in Flash. So wow. I was going through in like the Icebox videos and all that. I was learning just by actually breaking open these videos and looking at how they did it. So that's how I learned Flash. And I started animating my own stuff based on that. And then there was a podcast I listened to called The Radio Adventures of Dr. Floyd. It was a, like a story podcast. And I was like, let me animate one of your episodes. And mm -hmm. the episode he had me animate, which at the time was cool, and now it has a very bad thing. It, it was uh, an episode where Jeffrey Tambor and Chris Hardwick <laughs> played like George Washington and uh, Thomas Jefferson, which was awesome to brag about at the time. And now both of them are like accused of, you know, I don't brag about that as much anymore. <laughs> but yeah, I, I got the opportunity to do it. I didn't know what to do with that. Like it got tons of hits and I could have made more connections, but me being a dumb idiot was just kind of like, what do I do now? And then I just kind of sat there and was like, maybe if I sit still, everybody will leave me alone. And I missed like a huge opportunity. And that's why when I started this thing again, I was like, you know what? I'm just going to see what I can do by just reaching out to people again. And that's how this whole thing started. So that my background in animation was basically that, like I had one class in high school and I've always been fascinated with animation and wanted to do it. The hardest thing to teach like high school kids. I tried, I mean, a little bit, but yeah. I mean, it's such a hard thing to learn animation. 
yeah. takes a second to watch, takes a lifetime to make. <laughs> exactly. exactly. It's interesting that you reached out to me because I, I, I listen to all these podcasts that are very painting focused, lots of painting focused podcasts. I was just thinking about how, you know, there's no podcasts that are like more broad for like all types of art, or I haven't really come across them. And I was just thinking I should start a podcast for animation or mixed media or something like that. You should. Oh my God, you totally should. I would listen the hell out of that. <laughs> <laughs> all right. <laughs> Maybe I should. Yeah. yeah. I feel the same way. I'm like at this place right now where I'm like, I've been living in New York for, I guess, a couple years now. I moved out and then came back again. I'm trying to like establish more relationships with different artists and community. And I feel like that's where everything's going. It's just, it's like we're a small world and mm -hmm. we can all like help each other. All artists go through the same thing, like motivation and keep going and how do you make money and all these things. I mean, it's amazing that you're doing this and there needs to be more, you know, connections and you, we're heading in a good direction, I think. You absolutely should. There was, let me put it this way. I was doing nothing. I started this in 2017. I wasn't doing anything. I didn't know anybody. And I just was like, how can I meet other people? I could go show up and what am I going to do? Walk up to someone and go, hey, how are you doing? I'm an artist too. I wanted to know about them. So how do I do that? I go, hey, tell me about yourself and we'll let other people know about you. If you want to reach out and collaborate with more people, I recommend highly that you start one. And there's so many different ways you do it. I To break it up, like I did seasons, I'll just do a group of these. Like I'll go do 13, 14 interviews record them all and put them out. And then they get put out weekly. And during, while they're being put out, I can kind of plan, like I've pivoted what I've done several times. It's a great platform to just meet people. It's just networking. Yeah. You're like put, giving somebody else a platform. You have also have a platform. People are getting to know you and then you're helping people know other people. You should do it. All right. Maybe I will. Lindsay also tells me about a children's book that she worked on. Upside Down Town. It's a, a woman that she's like a homeless lady that is a yoga instructor. And she finds a town of a bunch of people that are standing on their heads. And she teaches them how to not have headaches again. I'm not going to spoil the ending. <laughs> <laughs> I love that there's a spoiler alert in the children's book. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to give away the whole thing. But okay. It's been illustrated. It's done. It just has to be edited and I have to find a, a publisher. So if anybody knows anyone. <laughs> okay. You don't know uh, what date it'll be coming out yet? No, I self-published it like a couple of years ago, but I'm like, I, I actually want to think I want to publish it under a real publishing company, I guess. I don't know what the pros and cons are, but it's kind of like my next step is to maybe publish it because then I think it'll actually maybe make money by itself without having to promote it. But it would be cool to get insight on that from a publishing company or right yeah i worked with somebody that's like he published a children's book and then it's still making money like it's in the stores and he published it like maybe like 10 years ago or something yeah so he, he sees like a check from it like every so often different from animation where i think like at one point youtube was like well if you get under over a certain amount of hits for it you make some money but that never really happened <laughs> To learn more about Lindsay, you can visit her website at lindsaycovenat.com. The music for this episode is from the song Just In Case by my band Lorenzo's Music at lorenzosmusic.com. If you haven't already, you can subscribe to this podcast at my website, tomrayswebsite.com, or on Spotify or wherever else you get your podcasts. Just search for Tom Ray's Art Podcast. I'll be back with another episode next week. So until then, so long. Thank you.